Hello, this is Dr. Harriet Fraud. And I'm Juliana Forlano here with our podcast, Capitalism Hits Home. This is a show about the intersections of capitalism with class, race, gender, and every aspect of our personal and home lives. We aim to educate, activate, and even alleviate some of the burdens we all experience living in a capitalist USA. We hope that this program serves you well. It's brought to you by Democracy at Work, and we would love your feedback. Just remember that. So the the big topic that we're going to cover today is why sex is better under socialism. But first, we have some very exciting viewer mail. This is our, our first time doing the viewer mail response that we, we have talked about. And as Harriet said just a moment ago, we love your feedback. And if we're going to do viewer mail, we, we, need, we need your feedback. <laughs> Harriet, um, first of all, hi, and how are you? I'm all right. I'm fine. And I was really glad to get this mail because it was such a thoughtful question that Rachel Arief, now I'm pronouncing it correctly, that um, she sent. What she says is, I'm a U.S. expat living in Barcelona since 2005. My choice to leave the USA to live in a European country has led me to realize the truth about many, many things back home that would have been much more difficult to discover if I had stayed. I have a question and topic for your broadcast. What is the intersection of narcissism and capitalism, specifically in the U.S., where narcissism seems culturally ingrained and even celebrated. Why? This is probably an easy one for you, but I'd be interested to hear you speak and for you and Juliana, I'm adding that, to discuss this. So I will begin to address it, which is in capitalism, it doesn't pay you. You are not a good businessman or woman if you give people exactly what they earn for you, you know, then you're not getting any profit. And what's the point of being in business if you don't get profit? So you are cheating people from the get-go. If you have compassion for your fellow citizens who work for you and worry about their being constrained rather than you getting more, you won't be a good business person. So built into the capitalist business plan is narcissism. And we have seen where it can lead since our proto-fascist, happily ex-leader, is the epitome of narcissism, thinking only of people suffering in terms of his own aggrandizement. So that as the country was coming down to COVID, he thought, no, the economy has to keep running or else people won't vote for me in the business sector because they won't be making money. Suppress the virus, which of course increased it and made us now the second worst country in the world in terms of COVID-19. Britain, UK currently leads, but that he has turned a blind eye to our suffering. But he is aggrandizing himself. And in his platform where he said, I'm for anybody who's for me. You like me, I'll like you and reward you. You don't, I won't. It's all about me, in other words. Now, there were 74 million Americans who thought that was just fine, who voted for him, and who won't wear masks because they think this is my individual right, even though they may infect everybody else and get infected. But they're only thinking of themselves. Narcissus was a Greek god who looked at his reflection in the pond and fell in love with himself. And he got so enamored of his own image that he fell in the pond and drowned. Well, narcissism Hmm. is being so interested in yourself, your own aggrandizement, your own profit, that you don't see anyone else. There's a very good film called 
Capitalism by Costa Gavras, the famous filmmaker, in which the protagonist, who's making more and more money, but he's losing everyone who cared for him, his wife, his children, his colleagues. And one of his colleagues who gave him the tip that made him rich said, you're losing everyone. He said, I don't care. I'm winning. I'm winning. Because he's getting more and more. That's ultimate narcissism, where you don't care about connection. You don't care about other human beings. You just care about yourself. And capitalism is the fertilizer that grows that narcissism. So that would be my response. That's such an interesting response, Harriet, of course, as usual. Um, What I was thinking of when I first saw the question and also just kind of ping-ponging off what I just heard you say is this idea, you know, narcissism, the theory has it, that narcissism comes from having a narcissistic injury at some point in life. And that was the thing that stuck with me. We can go through Trump's old life, but we can just also talk about any person living under narcissism that, or excuse me, under capitalism. Capitalism, obviously, you know, you need to make money. You need to make money by selling stuff. You set, you make sure people have a need for the stuff that you sell. I mean, we sell a lot of extraneous crap that isn't food, shelter, and housing in this country. And, you know, the advertising industry has done a great job making women, for example, feel like they're hideous and therefore they need that cream or no one will ever love them and they won't be able to reproduce and whatever, you know. Um, So there are a lot of attacks in a capitalist society on people that can cause that narcissistic injury that causes people to just think about themselves. And there's a lot of fear along with, you know, that goes along with narcissism. Now, I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos about narcissists and everyone hates them. Oops, you're going to have to believe me. (laughs) Sorry. Everyone hates them. And they, you know, and narcissists do cause a lot of injury. And narcissism itself does cause a lot of injury, the inability to sort of see outside of yourself, uh, to see the needs of others. And um, I, I think that capitalism both causes narcissism and then is is an effect of narcissism. This idea of not being able to see outside of yourself toward the needs of others. If you're going to have a system that requires sharing, like if you're going to transition from capitalism to even regulated capitalism or, you know, democratic socialism, if we're not going the full whole hog, some other system, you need to be able to think about the needs of others. And that is something that real narcissists cannot do. Meanwhile, it's like if you grow up in a society that 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 teaches you that not to think of others, to race to the top, undermine your neighbor, your friend, the people that you're selling product to. If you don't, you'll be undercut by Walmart or one of these other big corporations, etc. It, it makes people fearful. It makes you think only of yourself. It 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 kind of shoehorns people into narcissism. Where if you have a society that is based on a common good, it, it, it mitigates against rampant narcissism. It sure does. Co-ops are the example of that, where your livelihood doesn't depend on outdoing your neighbors and your friends on, at work, but cooperating. That's the opposite. Yeah. So thank you, Rachel Ariaf. I think that the question actually sub- segues perfectly into our next, you know, our, our long discussion, which is part four of our uh, our four part series of the intersection of sex, sexuality, and capitalism about why sex is better under socialism. And it isn't it nice to start with the idea of maybe a lot of things are better when we think about the common good. Harriet, I'm. Um, uh, I, I'm, I just want to hear sort of your thoughts and, and where you'd like to go in terms of this conversation. Where I would like to go is looking at sex under state capitalism, which is also a kind of, or state socialism, which were was the Soviet Union and the Soviet bloc countries. And under- it doesn't, When you think about sex in the Soviet Union, you just, it doesn't, you know, <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't have a connotation of, I mean, it's very cold, much of the Soviet yeah. Union. 
although, you know, the United States led us to think that Soviet women were all built like tractors, and that's what they were interested in, and that they yes. didn't have any life, and that they looked terrible, which was part of our propaganda that you can't be gorgeous without all sorts of capitalist products and pressure to be thin and fit and all the rest. So that's some of that. But to begin with, there's a wonderful book, I'll hold it up, because I hope we have, I hope our, uh, the writer of this is, is this right? Am, am I getting the book in there or am I messing it up? Why there women, it is. Why women live, live better, have better sex under better socialism. Sex under socialism by Kristen Godsey. And we hope she'll be a, a person who comes to our program. And I think she will because she really loves our program. It's very flattering. But in any case, what she does is she looks at the state socialisms, she calls them, and looks at and compares them with Western socialism and Western capitalism, rather. And what she finds is that women have more orgasms, that they have more comfort, that they have more awareness of their own sexual needs and more satisfying sex lives under state capitalism or state socialism, as she calls it. Now, why could that be? She goes into why that is. And she finds that when women are in a society where we have been warned against sex, whereas men have been far too encouraged to um, channel all their needs for comfort, for solace, for friendship, for hugs into sex, there's a terrible misfit. And American women have been channeled by our absent sex education curriculum, by our religion emphasis. These Soviet bloc countries did not have a strong presence of churches that told them that sex was mm. sin, that the original sinful person was Eve, and that women are pretty bad ever since, and that God sent Adam and Eve out of the garden with a curse to Eve. Your husband that would be enough to make my life better. <laughs> that would be enough to make. My, I mean, just to not have that playing in the background, and even having you know, when you're aware of it and you're enlightened to it, it's still there. It's still <laughs> you know, it's still, it's still there in the background. It's still role. Painting our lives, and you know, God says in sorrow as He hurls Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, in sorrow shall thou bear forth children and thy husband shall rule over thee. So that's a pretty mean curse that you're inferior and your husband will rule over you. And, and childbirth is going to suck. <laughs> that's how I read that one. That's right. Yeah. And so um, sex in capitalist societies like ours becomes a more rare commodity that men buy because it's withheld from them. They're not sexual equals men and women. And so sex is withheld and becomes a valuable commodity to buy. If you marry someone, you support her or are supposed to and have access to her sexuality. In countries where women are not economically dependent, they're freer to have better sex lives. Because if you have a commodity, if you buy something, you don't really have to worry about what you bought. It's yours. You bought it. You don't have to worry about it. And if it's having a good time, you so use what it. Do you, what do you make of the fact that they keep saying things like women are more economically independent in capitalist countries than they are in, in socialist countries? Well, that's I mean, lie. that's like a, some hogwash, right? It is. It is some hogwash. It's a total lie because even in the authoritarian states, which we don't highly recommend at all, like East Germany or, you know, Czechoslovakia before 1968 or whatever, you and the Soviet Union before Stalin, even in those societies, because they wanted women 
to give birth and also to work because their economies needed it. In the Soviet Union, after World War II, 30 million Soviets died in that war. The United States, it's under the number that have died of COVID so far. So they needed more population. And in order to go from the most backward country in Europe to a major power, they needed women's workforce participation. They also needed births. So what they did was they designed an excellent abortion access for those who wanted it, but support for women, well-paid maternity leaves creches where you could leave your children safely, early childhood programs, after-school programs that were well-developed and around children's needs, canteens where you could pick up dinner for your family. Now, they didn't say, why doesn't the man make the dinner? No, they stayed within gender stereotypes that way. But they encouraged women to escape from the total burden of domestic responsibility and childcare. And this makes the sex better. How? I know a lot of my friends here are are like always concerned that if they have an unwanted pregnancy, then it's going to be a big thing. And, you know, some don't believe in abortion, some do, but still don't want to have one. Some want to have the kid sure. and then they have economic stress. I think that does actually trickle into people's thoughts in the bedroom. Even if you're using, you know, there's no 100% method unless you tie tubes and have it some sort yeah. of sterilization of some sort. Right. It does bring well, you I, up if you're not interested in having kids to have better sex, yeah. knowing that you're not going to be making one that day. And that if you do, there will be care for it. That's right. And it will allow women to not worry about being economically dependent on a man who can then rule over them because they're so dependent and they have a child and they rule over them and the child. So that's always a fear. There are all sorts of stories of women feeling they have to have sex with their husbands or else they won't get the money that they need for the household, for the kids, for themselves. Men have, have that men even power. Have men in the United States, are they still, is that, I mean, I don't know, maybe oh, I'm too open-minded, so I don't know what the hell's going on yeah. in the outside world, <laughs> but, are you know, that is still part of the interaction between married couples, right? This, the, the financial aspect, and that trickles right into the bedroom. Right. So it's not only in the sex industry, which we talked about in the sugar industry last week, but in the bedroom. There, you know, if anyone saw The Shape of Water, which was such a huge success, there the woman has sex with the husband because she wants a Cadillac. And that's pretty obvious. That after he comes, she says, and he, he seems to use her like people use a steam drill on the sidewalk. Mm. And she doesn't look like she's saying anything or having any fun at all, but she looks like she's getting a Cadillac. But there is then the use of sex to get for women to get what they need, whether it's spending money, time out with their friends. They can always ask the man for what they need after he's come so that they can get it. There's a whole negotiation for economic oh, support. Like after the guy, I hadn't even thought about that, Harriet. That's a great idea. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's uh, don't that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Cut. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm yeah. yeah. But no, so but I get, I, I get that. And I think it doesn't it contribute also to the divorce rate because women are expecting uh more. Uh, but this is where I get confused. Okay, we have a, if we had a great social safety net in the United States and we had the opportunities afforded to us by our kind of cultural, some of the good cultural things that are here in the United States um, and the job opportunities, et cetera, for women that maybe aren't allowed in other countries that are more repressive. If we had a good social safety net, maybe if we didn't, again, move all the way to socialism, do you think there would be more divorce because women would feel 
like, hey, I don't, there's no reason for me to stay in this if I, no, the kid is going to be taken care of. It doesn't turn out that way. Actually, people have fewer divorces because they have a more companionate marriage of equals and can talk better. One of the other things of the state capitalisms, which is also present in the Scandinavian social democracies, which are democratic socialisms, they also have excellent sexual education for males and females, where they teach them all about their own pleasure and being able to say what they want and having orgasms and all the rest. They also encourage their children to be able to have their boyfriend sleep over in high school, knowing that they'll be well protected and they're welcome in the family. Sex is a non-talked about thing in the United States. And therefore, we have the most teen pregnancy. We have the most STDs. We have the most abortions because people don't want to be seen being so sinful. They're preparing, they're thinking ahead mm. rather than just meeting, committing a venal sin. They're, com they're actually sinning much more because they're planning to have sex. God help us. So to speak. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh my gosh, gosh. And so yeah. You have a kind of also the shame of sex is transferred onto women whose sex is commodified. We're supposed to resist the lascivious predations of men in order to be, quote, virtuous. And so that sex becomes a commodity that women can bargain for marriage or anything else. There was a joke in the 60s when women and 50s when women tended to be married much longer. Men are like linoleum. You lay them right once, you can walk on them for 20 years, right? That's funny. Because <laughs> you know, it was, but of course, men had their equivalent. There's a handy little thing called a wife. You screw it on the bed, it does all the housework, right? <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Yeah, but what you have is you have religious pressure on women, you have social pressure on women. You have economic pressure on women who can't earn as much and can't support children and can't take care of and support children simultaneously and don't have the supports in childcare, all of those things. And so they all add up. That's why in East Germany and West Germany, she studies before and after, sex before and after the collapse of the Berlin Wall and finds that Eastern European women had much greater satisfaction. And men thought they were a whole lot more responsive in bed, too, because they weren't afraid. And in West Harriet, Germany, they were more afraid. I think you um, just pointed at my final question um, for you, because we're, I can't believe Moving we're out of time. Home. It's like we just started. <laughs> Always. Um, is sex better for men under socialism as well? We've talked mostly about women. Yes, it is, because having a responsive partner, unless you want to just kind of drill your partner and use her to get off and not notice she's human. Is that sex, sex is or is that masturbation with a person? <laughs> but then it, you know, Eastern European men and men after the fall of the wall had sex with Eastern European women found that it was much more fun because they had an equal partner who could say what she wanted, who could enjoy it, who didn't come with it with all sorts of shame. And the same, I'll just do a, I know we don't have time, but in the social democracies of Scandinavia, Sweden being the most backward, the Netherlands, which is included there, being the most developed, kids don't learn sex education. They, and that was so in the Eastern Bloc countries. They learn about sexuality, their own as a part of life, which is welcome, and a partner's, how to have pleasure and please your partner. Very different idea from the shameful way or the purely biological way sex is taught 
in those 17 out of 50 states that have sex education that's biologically correct but emotionally absent. And so, you know, that too is more satisfying sexually for women and for men. Whoa. We look forward to hearing all of and reading your all of your comments uh, underneath the video or however you feel like getting them to us. I think you can uh, get us at the democracy at work dot info website as well. Um, and we're happy to use your comments. And um, we always ask for permission if if we can use your name, uh, but use your comments, respond to your comments and maybe respond on air and also at whatever suggestions you have for what you'd like to see us have a discussion around. We do thank uh, Rachel for the, the the suggestion for today. That is all we have time for. Um, I do want to make a plug. Thank you, everyone who is contributing financially to our program. We are not fully self-sustaining yet. Democracy at Work is help, is helping us, but we do need to become self-sustaining. So if you have a, a little bit of cash and you find this helpful, uh, we could use it patreon.com forward slash capitalism hits home. Again, patreon.com and then forward slash capitalism hits home is where you can make a contribution to support this program. Also, you can support us by sharing, uh, making comments uh, below. You know, that helps the algorithm on YouTube uh, and wherever you're seeing this, just tell your friends about it. Yes, oh, thank I do want to remind everyone to that, that, you know, we've had four this is our fourth section on sexuality. So uh, if, you, if you're just tuning into this one, definitely go back and watch the last three. We did the sugar industry. We did um, sex education. What was the other one, Harriet? I forgot. Let's see. I forgot to. <laughs> well, it's good. Whatever it was, it got us on a roll to do for three more. So thank you so much, everyone, for watching. Um, you can follow Harriet on her website, harrietfraud.com. It's H-A-R-R-I-E-T-F-R-A-A-D. I'm Juliana Forlano. You can find me and follow me and ask me whatever on Twitter. Uh, Democracy at Work is both on Twitter and Instagram at democracy at W-R-K. And if you're watching us on YouTube, again, please leave a comment. It really helps spread the word. Thanks so much. Thanks, Harriet. And thanks to Brian Isom, like isometric. Maria Carmola. Yes, we've been, mispro we've been mispronouncing Brian's name this whole time. Yeah, but we're going <laughs> now. And all the people from Democracy at Work that make this podcast possible.